Cool, thanks. Yeah, it's a little early on Sunday. Yeah, we're going to be rolling old school today with um, some ARP. So uh, I know uh, hacking ARP has been around for a bit. We're going to kind of go over some of the uh, the classic attacks and then a little bit of a twist on some of them, a little bit more effective here and there. Um, some of the tools that are out there that, that do things like ARP cache poisoning and stuff like that don't really uh, take advantage of some of these techniques. So i um, going to go over that. So uh, first we're going to start with kind of a, a background on ARP. Um, for, for most of you, this is probably going to be um, pretty basic, but uh, it's kind of essential to, to build what, what really ARP is um, and, and what it does and how we can attack it. So obviously network systems, like in a network, <laughs> um, need a way to talk to each other. And a lot of times we think of, of them talking to each other via protocol address, like IP addresses. But uh, on a, a local area network or a physical network, they actually have to talk via physical addresses. And so we need a way to translate from our protocol address, like our IP address, to the physical, net, physical addresses, like MAC addresses. Um, ARP in this particular talk, we're in in reference in this talk, we're talking about ARP over uh, over Ethernet and uh, in reference to IPv4. So ARP can work in other environments, but we're specifically talking about that particular environment right now. So the address resolution protocol allows us to uh, resolve um, a hardware address from given a, a protocol address. So if we have an IP address. Uh, like 192.168.1.100 and we want to talk to it, we, uh, we can send a, an ARP request packet out to the broadcast of the network. Um, it's kind of like a who has 192.168.1.100. And every host on the network, since it's sent out to the broadcast, gets this particular uh, uh, request packet. And if their protocol address matches the protocol address in uh, the field, uh, for the target protocol address in the ARP request packet, they send out a response to the sender saying, I'm at blah, blah, blah. So here, 192.168.1.100 sends out that they are at the hardware address 00DF1A9CA378. So, okay, so now we have a way of translating between hard, uh, protocol addresses or IP addresses and hardware addresses. But Obviously, there'd be a lot of chatter on a network, unnecessary chatter on a network, if uh, for every packet or every frame that has to go out on a physical network, uh, we have to send out an ARP request and receive an ARP reply. So hosts, in order to overcome this, this overhead, have uh, local caches of, ARP, uh, of MAC address and IP pairs. So it's the, the ARP cache. What this does is it just, once uh, we've resolved um, an IP and MAC pair, we cache it for a certain period of time uh, locally so that when we go to communicate to another host again, we look in our table and if, it, if the, uh, the ARP entry exists, then we know where to go. We don't have to send out an ARP request again. So this is, this is where really um, part of, of the weaknesses in ARP kind of starts out is... Um, is that particular table. So we'll go over a little bit of an, a background and anatomy of an ARP packet to begin with. So um, this is kind of a typical ARP packet. Uh, one of the first field is hardware type field. And so this specifies what, what the underlying type of hardware uh, that we're sending our frames on is. Uh, typically, in, and in our environment, what that we're talking about today. This is going to be set to the code for Ethernet. Next we have the protocol type, which again specifies what protocol we're using. So we're, this will be filled with the code for T, uh, IPv4. Then the next two fields are hardware length and protocol length. So what that because um, we can use different protocols and different hardware mediums in order to send um, ARPs over, we obviously the addresses, the associated addresses, can vary the length of, of those addresses. So we need a place to specify how long each field should be as far as the protocol length and the hardware length. So that's done in these two fields. We'll, we'll go over um, 
actual examples of art packets in a little bit and, and what, fee, what values go in there. The next is going to be the opcode. And this is typically going to be either a request or a reply. So this is where in the packet we specify what kind of packet we're, um, we're sending, if we're sending an ARP request or if we're sending an ARP reply. And, and that's how our, the associated hosts uh, translate that, that packet when they receive it. The sender hardware address is pretty self-explanatory. This is the hardware address, or MAC address in our case, of the sender's, uh, uh, sender's Ethernet card or, or interface card. So um, whoever's sending out an ARP request or an ARP reply, they put their own hardware address of the interface that's going out into this field. Same thing with the sender protocol address. This is, of course, how in, in your typical or standard ARP uh, conversation, not um, we're, we're going to abuse these fields a little bit in order to get what we want out of it. So then you have the target hardware address, which is pretty self-explanatory again. It's uh, the hardware address or MAC address of the target we're, we're sending our packet to, and target protocol address, which would be the IP address of that target. So as an example, um, if 192.168.1.20 wants to get wants to speak with 192.168.1.100, they send 1.20 will send an ARP request packet out to to the local network broadcast, and this is what the packet will look like. We see that uh, the first the first field the ether the hardware type is set to uh, zero one, which is the code for Ethernet. The uh, the protocol type is set to IP. The Ethernet length is set to six because it's six bytes for an Ethernet um, address. And the protocol length is four because it's an IP, IPv4 or four byte um, address. We also see the opcode is one, which uh, is the code for, for an ARP request. And then we have all the different, uh, the sender hardware address, which is the, the requester's hardware address and their IP address in the protocol, the sender's protocol address, and then target hardware address, which here is set to null because that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to resolve the what the hardware address for the IP address that we have. So that's set to null and sent out on the wire. And then uh, we have the IP address that we're trying to resolve in the target protocol address. So the response looks like this. 192.168.1.100 replies, sends out an ARP reply with its hardware address, 00AABBCCDDFF. Um, and it's specifically sent to 1.20 and uh, to its, uh, the target, you can see that the target hardware address and target protocol address are both filled out correctly. And the sender hardware address and sender protocol address um, are filled out with the, uh, the host that's answering. Um, this then, in turn, the the host 192.168.1.20 will take that and enter it into its ARP or, or update its ARP cache um, for 1.100. So now it does it knows uh, who belongs to 1.100 and doesn't have to send out more requests until a timeout occurs. So traditional ARP po uh, ARP attacks. Um, one of the, the most common ARP attacks for taking over really any uh, local area network is ARP cache poisoning. ARP cache poisoning is, since ARP is completely unauthenticated, you might have noticed as we were talking about, even if you're not familiar with ARP cache po poisoning, the dangers as we were talking about, a, a host sends out an ARP request and it receives, uh, somebody else sends out an ARP reply, and when it receives that ARP reply, it updates it ca its cache. It has no sort of authentication to verify who actually sent the, the ARP reply, so it doesn't really know who, who it's talking about to. And that's what ARP cache poisoning is really about. You basically, uh, since it's completely unauthenticated, whoever sends a reply, a reply to the requester first wins and gets their information, or whether it's legitimate or spoofed, uh, input into the, the ARP cache. Uh, we have another condition, though, where sometimes um, the ARP cache can be updated with gratuitous ARP replies. So even if the host didn't send out an ARP request um, and it's just humming along, um, 
it, and re re receives an ARP reply, then it'll still update its cache because uh, it's dumb. So, <laughs> uh, so basically, that's that's really what most of the ARP cache poisoning tools rely on. Instead of waiting for an ARP request to go out and trying to race with the the actual owner, it just sends out gratuitous ARP replies in order to try to update the cache. This isn't effective on all operating systems, but um, many operating systems, uh, this is the case. So basically, you just, in order to exploit this, you just send out forged ARP reply packet to a victim. You put in the legitimate uh, Tar or sender protocol address, whatever you want to, to hijack the connection of, and your MAC address or some other MAC address, and, uh, and effectively poison the ARP cache so that the victim is now talking to you when it thinks it's talking to Joe Blow Gateway. So the results of this, as you can see, are probably the most common is man in the middle. If we poison, poison an ARP cache entry with our own uh, MAC address information, or our own hardware information for, say, the gateway, then all the hosts, or, or, or all the traffic between the host and the gateway, or any, of course, obviously any traffic going uh, to, to hosts on the other side of the gateway, are going to go through us first. So we can look at it, we can modify it, we can uh, sniff it, whatever we want to do, classic man in the middle attack, and then pass it on to the gateway as if it were legitimate, legitimate, yeah, legitimate traffic, sorry. Uh, another condition with this would be denial of service. So if we put in, uh, instead of putting in our, our own our, uh, MAC address or a legitimate MAC address in order to hijack the connection, we can just put in a bogus or non-existent random MAC address and now that host can't communicate with, with that the other host. So you can sever connections between hosts. Obviously the, the benefits of that can either be just simply uh, for fun or malicious um, or if, if it's used in conjunction with other attacks like say we're attacking or tr attempting to exploit a vulnerable server but we know that we're already on the local network and we know that the server is logging to some central syslog server or reporting to some central intrusion uh, detection sensor, then we can, we can uh, sever that connection, deny service between those two hosts, and now prevent that external logging as we carry out the rest of our attack. So an example of man in the middle attack would be client sends an ARP request for 1.1, and um, <clears throat> we can see that the, it's a, a standard ARP request packet, so we have uh, the sender, the sender hardware address and protocol address, which are our, our victim host, and then target hardware address, again, is null, and we're looking up 192.168.1.1. And it's a request packet, as you can see in the, the opcode field. Now, before 1.1 responds, the attacker now sends another ARP, uh, an ARP packet directly to 1.20 at 00AABBCCDDEE, and says, hey, I'm 1.1. <laughs> And uh, it gives it its MAC address, so 00AABBCC01AA. So now, the attacker is actually the the victim 1.20 is talking to the attacker where it, um, it thinks it's talking to the gateway or 1.1. So the attacker can do anything it wants with that that data stream, inject things in, sniff on it, um, uh, gather usernames and passwords, anything that's that's relevant. Again, an example of denial of service would be that 182.168.1.20 requests a hardware address of the gateway. Again, same packet. And the attacker, instead of replying with, with his credentials in order to perform a man in the middle, uh, replies with bogus, um, a, a bogus MAC address of 00 dead beef 01. So now the, the victim goes to try to talk to the, the gateway and can't. The, the communications channel is severed because it doesn't really know the hardware address even though it thinks it knows the hardware address of 1.1. So it, it sends packets out and it never receives, or 1.1 never receives them. Another ARP attack, classic ARP attack, uh, is a CAM table overflow. And this has been around for a long time. The, the reason for this specific attack is that 
back in the day when anybody used hubs, uh, a hub is just a, a dumb piece of network equipment. So two hosts communicating over a hub, all of their traffic is forwarded to all of the ports on that hub. So you, if you're plugged in anywhere on that hub or that physical network, you can intercept or, or sniff, eavesdrop, on any of that traffic and, and that conversation. Um, and even potentially uh, inject things into stream as well and things like that. So switches, though, are different. As we probably all know, that switches maintain um, a table. Um, it, this is actually called a, a CAM table or content addressable memory table. And what, what this table holds is a, a, a matrix of pairs between port numbers and MAC addresses that are discovered on those port numbers, along with some other information. But what, what's relevant to our discussion right now is that MAC address and port number pair. So it, the CAM table says that uh, switch port 23 has these MAC addresses associated with it. So when an Ethernet frame arrives at the switch, instead of broadcasting in that frame out to all ports, it instead looks it up in the CAM table and, um, and only forwards it to the port where that MAC, MAC address actually exists. So that kind of severs our ability to... Uh, to eavesdrop on conversations because now we're not getting that traffic. Even if we're in promiscuous mode or whatever, that traffic just never receive, uh, ends up on our network port. So a CAM table overflow, uh, what it does is no matter how big your switch is, no matter what kind of enterprise switch you, you have, it's going to have a size limit to, uh, to the CAM table. I mean, it's, it's not going to be infinitely sized. So there's going to be some point at which it can't, uh, it, it has to overflow or, or purge other information out of the table if it receives too much information. So basically what you do to, a, to uh, perform a CAM table overflow is you send hundreds or thousands of spoofed Ethernet frames with spoofed MAC addresses to the network and overflow the internal CAM table of the, the network switch. So here the network switch gets filled up, starts purging out legitimate data, and now when legitimate traffic or legitimate frames enter the switch, it doesn't have a pairing for in that CAM table for a, a legitimate MAC address. So it then ends up broadcasting it to all of the, the ports on the switch. So effectively turning the switch into a hub, just like, um, just like we were able to do before. So now we can, sw we can sniff again on, we can now sniff again on traffic on the local network, um, just like we were able to with a hub. There are weaknesses though with these we, these different ARP uh, attacks. ARP cache poisoning in particular, m most all of the current methods of ARP cache poisoning in the tools that, uh, that perform this particular attack, as well as different papers that uh, identify how to uh, do ARP cache poisoning, utilize ARP reply packets as, uh, as a way to uh, inject the falsified information into a host's uh, ARP cache table. But as we said before, not all OSs, most, will update when it just receives a gratuitous ARP uh, reply packet, even though it didn't send out a request. But not all OSs will. Um, some, some tools have overcome this by uh, sniffing the network, and so when it sees the first ARP request, it, it uh, races to, to respond faster than the legitimate host in order to inject its entry into the ARP cache. A cam table, cam table overflow obviously um, also has weaknesses and drawbacks. Cam table overflow requires hundreds or sometimes many thousands of spoofed frames, um, spoofed MAC addresses in order to actually overflow depending on the switch that you're actually using. So obviously if you're a savvy network engineer um, and you've got Ethereal running, then you can probably detect that an ARP cache um, or a CAM table overflow is, or something funky is coming, happening on your network. Um, it's, it's very identifiable, very noisy, um, lots and lots of, of you know, crap packets on your network. And we also can prevent uh, the traditional CAM table overflow with uh, technologies like port security, Cisco's port security, and, and other related types of, uh, of 
technologies that actually can just limit the amount of uh, the number of MAC addresses that are allowed to be identified on a, on a given port. So if we plug in to port 34 and we send out thousands of bogus frames, then port security says, oh, well, there's only 10 allowed on this particular port, and so then can either turn off the port or ignore traffic after that or whatever. So we're not able to effectively overflow the, the CAM table because we can't get that many frames uh, passed. So this really kind of mitigates, this is kind of the, the default answer for mitigating uh, the risk of a CAM table overflow. Again, really uh, can't, the, the whole idea of a switch, a switch is not a security device. So, um, relying on that you have a switched network uh, to prevent people from sniffing on your network is kind of retarded. But, um, but people do. And people, that they rely on using port security or they had to add port security because th this was kind of uh, an issue along with other issues in, in switch networks. So we're going to go over some uh, new kind of, not completely new, but attacks uh, on ARP and, and kind of take a different approach than um, the traditional attacks. Uh, to do this, I wrote a, a tool called ARPcraft, which basically just allows us to uh, put together ARP packets and send them on the wire with whatever uh, information we want put into the different fields of the ARP packet. So this is kind of the different options that are available with ARPcraft. We have, uh, we can specify the interface. We specify the um, source hardware address, the source uh, protocol address, the target hardware address and protocol address, whether and what the opcode is, whether it's a request or a reply packet. And we can also uh, specify the ethernet source and ethernet destination. So if we want, for, by default, uh, the ethernet source and destination match what the, um, the target hardware address and protocol address or, sorry, target uh, hardware address and source hardware address uh, fields are. But if we, for some reason, want to uh, to put a different MAC address in the Ethernet frame than we have in our ARP packet, then we can do that with those flags. Um, again, we, we can also uh, set the interval, so in seconds, how uh, often we want to send this packet out onto the wire. By default, I think uh, it's at five seconds. So every five seconds, whatever ARP packet we've built, we send that out onto the wire every five seconds. And then a count. We can um, set how many we want to, to send out. So if we uh, just want to send out one, or if we want to send out 5,000, we can, we can set that without having to rerun the tool. Huh. This is a pretty slide. <laughs> Not quite sure what the point with that was. Anyway, um, here's an example of uh, using ARPcraft to send out um, an ARP request to the destination protocol address of 192.168.1.100, which has a, a hardware address of 00, dot, or 00 AABBCCDDFF. Um, and we want it to say that it's from 182.168.1.20 uh, at the hardware address of 00AABBCCDEE. -E. So we, uh, we use ARPcraft and we specify the interface with the dash I. Um, dash SHA, we just put in um, our source hardware address in there, the MAC address that we want the, the packet to say it came from. And the SPA, the source protocol address, we, the IP address we wanted to, to say it came from. And um, then the target hardware address and target pro protocol address, respectively. And then the dash O flag, we, we want to send out a request packet. So here you'll see the, the tool kind of prints out um, a, a snapshot of what our packet looks like, kind of a layout of what the different fields in the art packet are going to look like, so that if, if something looks wrong, you can cancel it and, and maybe you made a mistake in the options or whatever. And then it just goes ahead and injects the ARP request to the, to the wire. Same thing with this, just another example of, uh, let's see. Hmm. Anyway. Um, okay, so another approach to, uh, to ARP cache poisoning, instead of, um, basically instead of using ARP reply packets, what, um, 
we went over the, the weaknesses already to a certain extent of ARP cache poisoning or tr the traditional methods of ARP, ARP cache poisoning. So s again, some OSs don't update their ARP cache just when they receive a gratuitous ARP reply. Um, most OSs, if not all OSs, um, according to RFC, don't, won't just add an ARP entry into the cache if it doesn't already exist in the cache when it receives a reply. So that, that's a little convoluted as far as that sentence. But basically what that means is if, I, if I'm a host and I receive a gratuitous ARP reply, because I, I didn't send out an ARP request, I just receive an ARP reply saying 182.168.1.1, the gateway, is at you know blah. Even if if 1.1 is in my cache and I'm a, a retarded host, then I will update my cache and say, okay, 1.1 is at blah MAC address. But I'm not going to add it to my cache if um, if it doesn't already exist there. I'll update it if it's already there. But I'm not going to add a new host to my cache just because I receive an ARP reply that I never sent out a request for. Then another weakness is like along the same lines, uh, some OSs, specifically Solaris, Solaris has kind of traditionally been uh, kind of harder to perform uh, ARP cache uh, poisoning on because the problem is that uh, Solaris doesn't rely, they, they don't really conform to the RFC specification as far as what to do when you receive an ARP request or a reply. If it has an entry in its table, um, in its local cache, and uh, it receives either a reply or a request or whatever, it doesn't update it. If, if it. if it differs from what it already has in its table, it does nothing. Um, but it, instead, it just goes on um, a timeout. So it waits for that entry to timeout, then it sends out a new ARP request and resolves it in that way. So in order to to poison, you're basically stuck in this race condition as far as you have to wait for Solaris to time out its entry, then send out the first request packet and respond with a reply faster than the legitimate host in order to poison a Solaris um, machine. In, in a way, that has, if you can do it correctly, it has a certain benefit because then that, that uh, host, that entry, your, your forged entry, is not going to be updated by even the legitimate server or legitimate machine. It's stuck in there until it times out. Um, we no notice though that RFC 826, which specifies the ARP uh, specification, says that if instead of an ARP reply, if a host receives an ARP request, so if if I am, am uh, sitting along as Joe Blow host and and I receive a request for my information, so my MAC address and I uh, according to my IP, and the target protocol address, of course, if if it um, because it's sent out to the broadcast, if it matches the information that I have, if it's my protocol address that it's looking for to, to resolve the, uh, the MAC address, then before responding, first the host um, updates or adds the source protocol address and, and hardware address pair to the local cache. So again, if, if somebody asks me for my information, whether if I have that information, um, if I have their information in my cache, or even if I don't, um, first of all, what I do is I check if it's in my cache. If it is, then I'll update it. If it's not, I actually add their information. So basically, it's for performance reason, reason. So that basic, so that if if uh, you don't have to both exchange and send out ARP requests, only one request uh, uh, initiation will will update the cache on both sides. So if you send out a request to a victim or to a, a host, um, they will, they'll update their cache with your information as well so that they're, um, they have the cache now in order to, to speak with you f further. Um, the actual verbiage from RFC 826, you can see there, um, it's pretty straightforward. It basically just uh, says what I just said. So. Instead of using an ARP reply packet, we can use an ARP request packet uh, to, to inject our information, the information we want, into an ARP cache um, in order to poison our ARP cache. Um, so all we need is a single packet. We don't have to wait for an ARP request to come out from them and try to, to race with a response. Um, all we need to do is uh, send out a request with our information and most hosts will just update if, if that host already exists in, in the cache. Otherwise, you can actually <clears throat> add new entries, where with a reply packet, it's not going to add a new entry into the cache, but we can actually inject new entries into the cache using a request packet. 
So here, the attacker, without being initiated by the, the victim, 1.20, the attacker just sends a request packet to 1.20 saying it's from 1.1, but it, it's with the attacker's MAC address. So we see that the opcode on this packet is 1.1, or is 1, or a request. So we're sending a request packet to 1.20 um, and saying the sender, sender hardware address is 00AABBCC01AA, which is the attacker's hardware address, and then saying our protocol address is the gateways and then sending it to uh, the victim, their har target hardware address and, and protocol address. Sorry? Yes. Sorry. Huh? Oh, I'm sorry. He said, is it unicast? Yeah, sorry. I'm bad at that. So, like, throw things at me if I don't repeat the question. So. I'm going to kind of demo that. So I'm going to send, say, here we have our, our victim here is a FreeBSD box. And um, I'm going to just enter a, a random uh, MAC address and IP pair into its cache. So here we have the, the current ARP cache, which has an entry for 1.1 and 1.157. Okay. Um, Okay, so we're just injecting uh, to 192.168.1.163 uh, an ARP request packet from 1.2 uh, saying that 1.2 is at 00, zero dead beef 01. So now we'll go over to the victim and look at it, the ARP cache. And we have an entry for 1.2 at dead beef 01 or 00, zero dead beef 01. So we can just. Uh, arbitrarily enter entries into the ARP cache using request as opposed to just uh, gratuitous reply packets. I'll uh, demo a little further that um, we can overwrite 1, 1 1.1, our gateway, with 00 dead beef 01 by using request packet 2. So here, 1.1, now, now we've overwritten the, uh, the gateway address with deadbeef01. So it's fairly uh, straightforward ARP cache poisoning technique, but it's just using a different packet type, so it's a little bit more reliable on different hosts. So again, 
uh, we talked about the weaknesses of some of the ARP uh, poisoning techniques. CAM table overflows obviously have certain weaknesses. They can be prevented with, uh, uh, with port security. They can be very easily identified uh, by an intrusion detection system or uh, an administrator running TCP dump. <clears throat> um, it takes thousands of, of packets usually in order to, to um, perform a successful CAM table overflow. Um, do you have a question? Uh, static cam table entries. Uh, yeah, that static entries are usually um, a, a fairly accessible, uh, acceptable defense for any of the even for ARP cache poisoning as well. Static ARP entries are probably the mo the the best way to go as far as defense. It's just on in in your average enterprise uh, network, you can't really create static entries for all of your hosts. So that's obviously a, a mitigating problem. Um, Okay, so we went over those those problems, but often, usually, we don't really need uh, in in a real targeted attack. We don't really need to sniff the entire network for something. I mean, it might be nice sometimes, but usually, we're going after one machine or um, more targeted approach, if, especially if stealth is uh, is in order at all. So. There, there's a couple of ways that we could already do that. We can, we can already um, inject into the or, or poison the ARP cache of a, a specific host. So a man-in-the-middle attack essentially allows us to sniff as well because traffic is going through us. So it's kind of a targeted sniffing approach. That's how most people um, get get by um, sniffing on on a switch network without using a cam table overflow. You just uh, poison the ARP cache with and, and perform a man in the middle attack, and then you can sniff on that traffic. But obviously, that's not always appropriate because now your MAC address is in in the the cam or the uh, ARP cache table of the victim. So you can uh, forensically and and further. It's it's just easier to identify who's actually perpetrating an attack, um, but a little bit back before, as far as the the whole cam table uh, scenario, if a switch receives a frame and checks its cam and doesn't have um, doesn't have that pair or that ent an entry that matches that frame, it again it floods it to the entire network. Um, so we can accomplish the same thing as opposed to flooding and overflowing the entire cam table. We can accomplish this this type of attack um, by just uh, here again use, utilizing the ARP cache poisoning technique. Instead of uh, poisoning and performing a man in the middle attack, we just poison the target with uh, a null MAC address. Um, and so basically when the target sends it out onto the network, the switch doesn't have an entry in its cam table, so it floods it to all ports again. Uh, but it still gets through. The, the gateway, the traffic is not going to be interrupted. So um, even if you don't, if you're in a man in the middle attack, you actually have to route the traffic back to the legitimate host. Here, it gets to all the ports and the legitimate host is still going to pick it up because it's got a null um, destination on the frame. So, um, so we can kind of uh, well, we, we can perform targeted sniffing or, or eavesdropping on a switched network by using this technique, on, and and this works on every switch that uh, is out there because it's really uh, the underlying principle is that it, it looks in the cam table, and since it, that that uh, pair, the null MAC address pair, uh, um, doesn't exist in the cam table, then it floods it to all the ports. Um, this doesn't require hundreds or thousands of packets. It requires a single packet in order to inject or, or poison the, the uh, mark, uh, <laughs> ARP table of uh, our victim host. So port security is not going to stop it. We're not actually sending, even if we're sending it to multiple hosts, we're not sending spraying thousands of random MAC address uh, or frames with random MAC addresses out to the network in order to overflow a CAM table. Uh, it's only a single MAC address, and so we're not using multiple entries um, in in the allowable entries from port security, etc. Um, and obviously, it's less identifiable. A single packet's a lot less identifiable on your network than thousands of bogus uh, packets. A um, few other fun little things with ARP. Um, 
some OSs can actually be poisoned uh, with their own MAC address uh, for the destination. So, um, in, so here we can actually poison the, uh, say we want to uh, sever a connection or denial of service connection between a, uh, a host and, its, and a logging server. All we have to do is send a request packet again <clears throat> with the sender hardware address, which equals the, the host that we're poisoning, and the target hardware address equaling the, uh, the host that we're poisoning. And then the, the uh, target protocol address and target sender, I mean target uh, sender protocol address uh, with, with the hosts that were, the, the target would be the, the host we're uh, poisoning and, and the sender would be the, the host that we're masquerading as. And now we can completely, basically the host doesn't even send it out to the network because um, it thinks it's local and so um, <coughs> the, the traffic never ends up on the switch. So it can't communicate with the log server, etc. Yeah? Yeah. What OS is let you do that? What um, Windows will let you do it. Um, Solaris will let you do it. Uh, I, I don't think, if, if I remember correctly, uh, FreeBSD, I think, doesn't do that. It actually does check if it's uh, in your, if it's already, you know, one of the local interfaces. Um, so just test. I mean, the, the tool, ArpCraft, is, is uh, going to be released for, so, you know, play around with, there's other network testing tools too, like Scappy and things like that that can do similar things, so. So here, obviously, um, tries to log uh, to a sys, you know, a network syslog server, uh, the attacks that you've done after poisoning the cache, can't talk to the syslog server, so, you know, nobody's going to see anything <clears throat> other than on the local host, so you pop whatever vulnerable service and, you know, drop the logs there. <clears throat> um, another thing that's kind of cool or kind of fun, silly, <laughs> is uh, that if a host receives an ARP request or a reply with the same protocol address as its own or, or one of its own on uh, interfaces, um, but a different MAC address, so it's saying, so some other host on the network is saying that it has that IP address, um, then most OS's, uh, Windows, a uh, bunch of the Nixes, things like that, will um, complain to the user that whether it's via syslog or console log or um, in case of Windows, it actually pops up a dialog that there's a duplicate IP address on the network. So you can, you can play games with, um, with Windows users by uh, sending them or popping up this nice dialog or a, a bunch of times. Helps out social engineering um, uh, attempts actually because if, if you do this, you know, uh, a bunch of times in a row or, or just do it in a loop and um, it actually burns up a, quite a bit of clock cycles. I've had Windows machines just crash if you just kind of keep sending them the thing. Um, but uh, <laughs> if, or if you just do it, you know, for a little amount of time and you call up as tech support and say that um, apparently they've been having, you know, a conflict of IP addresses and ask for their username and password. Most people actually do it, so, um, you know, kind of fun. <laughs> um, other fun with, uh, um, with ARP, the Kaminsky factor, um, got to throw in a, a covert channel, of course, over, over any protocol like DNS or ARP or whatever. Um, so just like any protocol that has optional fields or fields that you can play with, you can throw other data in it and, and get it across. So um, we, could, we can use ARP to, uh, to transmit you know, secret information over a local area network. Um, basically, I had a demo, but um, it's the, the other hardware's uh, not working. So um, basic, but I, I do have a, a better demo actually. <laughs> So um, we're actually in this case just using a sender heart or sender hardware address field, which is just four byte or um, six bytes of uh, of bandwidth per packet. I think I said four. Yeah, I had to rewrite this stupid slide deck last night because uh, I only brought the PDF version um, stupidly. So excuse any typos, please, because I wasn't not partying either. So. <laughs> um, Anyway, we get uh, six bytes of bandwidth per packet. Uh, somebody's saying something, but. Um, and then basically, in order to just kind of simply obfuscate the message over the wire, we uh, 
just threw in a little bit of XOR encryption with a, a shared key between the, the client and server and can receive you know, secret messages. We could uh, <clears throat> increase the bandwidth per packet by using more than one field or even more simply, since we can, since like we went over, we can specify the length of the address fields. We can specify whatever length we want for the hardware address field or the protocol address field, and just stuff as much data as we want. So we could specify a length of you know 1,024 and stuff a, a you know kilobyte of uh, of data in into that the hardware address field or the um, protocol address field, and, and put one packet on the network and and get all the data we want. Um, <clears throat> Another, uh, another kind of, kind of uh, extra thing. Uh, instead of just passing network, uh, passing messages over the network, I kind of went a step further and uh, threw together ARP SH. I'm going to show you um, just a fun little proof of concept. Uh, remote, so-called encrypted shell over ARP. Um, so fun for backdoors. Uh, kind of just proof of concept. It's totally buggy right now, but basically it's, uh, it consists of two parts, ARPSHD and ARPSH. And again, we just obfuscate the data so you know, dumb network administrators can't just see our, our complete traffic um, via XOR encryption and, and a, a simple shared key. So I'll demo that. Here's our victim. So somehow we've popped this machine with whatever vulnerability or whatever. So um, we're going to start um, ARP SHD. And over here, actually over here, we'll just uh, start a, uh, a network sniffer so we can sh see what traffic's actually being passed. It's not you know, actually wrapping it through Telnet or some crap like that. Um, <clears throat> so, put that up here, and uh, so we uh, yay! So there's no no ports listening on the victim server or anything like that. Um, it's just monitoring our traffic and uh, and detecting our our command, executing it and sending it back all over ARP. You can see all the traffic here. So, fun stuff. There you go. So really, uh, the moral as far as that goes is just you can't really trust any protocol um, to, to be what it really says it is. Um, what we're doing there is, again, just sending the data via the sender hardware address, um, sending a little bit, uh, what, two minutes? Oh, sorry. Well, I think we're... So ARP Venom is a tool that uh, it kind of automates these attacks. Check uh, didrev.org for uh, release and updates on that. Um, it should be up pretty soon. Uh, I don't think it's, uh, I got it posted yet. So um, again, traditional ARP attacks work well and they're good standbys. Um, they have certain weaknesses. So um, there's, there's certain cases where you can use some of the techniques uh, that I showed today that uh, would be a little bit more effective. And um, uh, targeted sniffing can be, uh, uh, again, accomplished by uh, poisoning with null MAC addresses um, for the intended destination. A lot less noisy than CAM table overflow can, can still do kind of the same thing. So um, a lot more reliable, too, for, for switches that have uh, port security and things built in. So any questions? Uh, I'm sorry. Can you? Yeah, 
Yeah, the question was, if, if you poison a, a victim with a null MAC address in order to do sniffing, um, does, the, does the destination host, while, while you get the data and are able to, to sniff the data, does, is the transmission interrupted? Is it, does the destination actually still get and process the data? And yes, in, in most every case, it does actually uh, accept and process that, that packet. So. Anyone else? Time to? Oh. Well, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for your time.